I got all that you said. And um, here again, we have to go back in time to before 17 December 1903 and the 17th the December 1903 itself for you to understand and appreciate the airports. So you remember uh, last week we were talking about, uh, sorry, for you, for you to understand airlines. So it starts off the same things. The Wright brothers were before 1903. The kind of flying which was done before 1903 was kind of those ones that you put a knapsack on your back, go and stand at uh, high areas, jump off into the air. It was more of paragliding and gliding flying before 17 December 1903. So to cap again, you remember we were talking about um, the Wright brothers thinking of designing something that was more convenient and a more enjoyable thing to have as a hobby. And they, they, they came up with what we call the self motorized um, self-motorized flights using their flyer one the aircraft that they nicknamed it or they gave name to it as flyer one now somebody will ask what a self-motorized flight is and for those of you who have not been with us on the previous programs is when you go to the airport how you see these normal aircrafts uh, fly they accelerate to a point where they become lighter than air then um, they, they, they get airborne in a controlled manner. They stay afloat in a controlled manner. And when it's time to descend, they descend in a controlled manner and go and land at their destination here again too in a controlled manner. This is what the Wright brothers designed and called it a self-motorized concept. So on 17 December 1903, they were just testing what they have been, uh, what, what had they, they had done on the drawing board for all this time. And they looked for a place to test it at Kill Devil's Hills in uh, North Carolina because of the wind situation at that time of the year. So to cut a long story short or to summarize it all, because it's not the main topic, but to summarize it all, their first test of that flight um, lasted only 12 seconds. And the aircraft kind of fell out of the sky. And when it did fall out of, fall out of the sky, uh, they took it to their garage made some adjustments here and there, and they rolled it back into the sky. <clears throat> this time, the other brother, there were two brothers, Orville and Will, Will Borright. So the other second brother took a turn and went up into the sky again. This time, on the second time, it stayed afloat for more than 12 seconds, and later it fell out of the sky again, the same way it fell out in the, uh, the, same, uh, the first experiment. They were still emboldened Rather than being discouraged, as any human being would have been, rather than being discouraged, they rolled it, they rolled it back into the hangar, did some adjustments on the flight controls and other things, and brought it back into the sky for the third time. When they flew, they stayed afloat for longer than the first and the second. And here again, too, they came out of the sky. And their last experiment, which was the fourth, um, after all these going back and forth into the hangar and making adjustments after every uh, fallout, the fourth one stayed afloat for 59 seconds. And I think they said they've had enough for the day. So what we're going to do is to uh, take the aircraft back into the hangar and, uh, you know, lock it up. Go spend the Christmas. If you know the history, 17 December is about a week to Christmas. So go spend Christmas and come back in January to, uh, 1904 and continue what they were doing. But like we said, by the time they had reached the second and third experiments here and there, so many, I mean, the, the news went viral because at, um, up until that time, nobody had seen any flying device apart from a bed. Nobody had seen any flying device do such wondrous things, if I should put it that way. So obviously, news went viral. People came together. They cheered and cheered and cheered the guys. And by the next thing they saw, it was in their national newspapers that this is what had happened. They sell the, the first uh, flight ever. So this one also inspired some people we call the Aero Dead Devils in aviation history, where these Aero Dead Devils decided, okay, if these guys have designed something of this nature, then um, I, am, I, I am going to design something that can go higher, faster, you know, and longer. So right now, speed, time, and distance became, so speed, uh, time, and altitude became the challenging factors. And you know, this flying was still not a passenger, uh, service. It was just something that were hobbies which were enjoyed by some few engineers and some sports enthusiasts and all those guys who like to pump up their adrenaline. So 
the focus became on who could go higher, who could go faster, and who could stay afloat longer. And people started to devise all sorts of um, um, device, I mean, aircraft, just like the Flyer 1. But um, the history has it that so many people came. By the time we got into 1908, four years down the road, we had even people manufacturing aircraft and things to do all this competition. And then came the racing. After so many people had manufactured aircraft where that can go higher, faster, and uh, stay afloat longer. Then came competitions, the season of competitions, where we wanted to outdo somebody and, you know, do it like a show. You go to a stadium and you go and watch all these things. And from last week's uh, presentation, we talked about the airport, how the airports came into being, all because there was something we call uh, racing. And um, I showed you how the evolution all the way to aerodrome and airport. So 1914 was the first world war. And I, by that time, 12,000 aircraft had been manufactured for war. It's a long history, which I want to cut short, but in summary, 12,000 aircraft had been available for war. And um, by the end of the First World War, 1919, the aircraft, that's the out of the 12,000, those that survived the war, when I say those that survived the war, those that were not bombed, bombed down and stuff like, stuff like that, um, were idle, sitting somewhere idle, and people thought of it as using it for cargo operations. Like I told you, in those days, moving letters around was a whole industry. It was a big deal. It was World Cup to move letters, including love letters, around. Especially a place like America, where it's a big state, and from one place to another, it's very far. So then came the cargo industry. If I say the air cargo industry for flying mills and uh, letters all around the place, then the idea just came that you know what? Why don't we just start a passenger service? So to cut a long story short, the passenger service um, started somewhere in Europe. We had airlines like KLM. Uh, which we started in 1919, just after the First World War. And we had Imperial Airways, that is today we know as British Airways, which started this whole show. And like we said, the industry uh, began to get better with time. After so many, you know, haphazardous uh, operations here and there, everything started to get better. And this airline service came to be. Now, everybody saw it as an essential service. When it started, it didn't still start with civilized airports per se. The airports were in remote areas. And so you even had to drive like, let's say one hour or so from your home uh, to this remote area called an airport and um, board this flight. It didn't go, it didn't have all these systems we have today where you go and check in, then you move to security, then you move here, you move here. You just go just near, near the aircraft. They just take your bag, put throw it into the cargo hold, and you sit down, you sit in this aircraft. And the aircraft were not as sophisticated as today. Okay, they were not sophisticated as today. So you sit inside sometimes almost like sitting in a bone shaker. Those of you have sat in bone shakers of uh, trucks, there are school trucks. When our school trucks were moving us from place to place, yeah, you know how it felt like when it's when it's negotiating a curve, you have to hold something or hold somebody. That was how. The airline industry or the aircraft of the which started the airline business started. Then, with time, things got better. We had a decade in history where we had regulations, where now flying from A to B had to be regulated. You know, air navigation services and all those they, they had to be regulated. If you know how to move from one airport to another, what systems are we going to put in place? That's going to be agreed by everybody around the world. Not that everybody is doing his own thing. For in those days, that's how it looked like. Everybody was, people were in their own corner doing their own things. And once in a while, there were incidents and accidents and the regulation just came in to make it better. So then came the best of airlines. So if you ask me what our airlines is, like I said, it's just basically flying somebody from one airport to another airport, irrespective of the distance, flying someone from one airport to another airport for a fee. So any company that is engaged in flying someone from A to B, that's airport A to airport B for a fee, is say, I mean, we say that person is in the airline business. So basically, I've talked about the history up until the World War I, aircraft that survived that were used for cargo, then later the idea came for airline industry, KLM and Imperial Airways, that's British Airways were one of the first uh, airline industries. And like I said, an airline industry is a business or a company that flies people from A to B for a fee. 
So basically, I'll stop here first. And, and, and that's how come, like I said, airlines got better all the way to today. And every time there are a lot of improvements and uh, it got to a certain point in time, almost all nations owned airlines, then later got to the stage of what you call privatization, where the state decided, okay, they'll allow private people to come on board, provided they are operating according to standards and regulations. Then came the private airlines competition, and this world has brought us to where we are today. So basically, an airline is a company that uh, is in the business of flying people from airport A to airport B with a fee using, uh, if I say, systems and you know people to do that. I hope I've done justice to the airline business. Okay, Captain, thank you very much. So if I understand you correctly, an airline is basically for commercial purposes. Commercial purposes as in transporting a person from one destination to another destination. You are right. So a, a company that is engaged in the business of flying people from airport A to airport B for a fee. This one, it doesn't matter how long the airports are far apart. Once you are flying somebody from A, airport A to airport B for a fee, then you are in the airline business. Then you, okay. So you are in the airline business. All right. So what's the difference between an airline company and then a charter company? Is there a difference? Yes, please. As a, the charter company will work almost like road transport, where this time you, um, the owner has exclusive use of the aircraft, either for a period of time or for that short time. So, for example, like the way we charter taxis, we don't want to go to maybe a bus station to go and queue and wait for a bus. Maybe we'll be late for some appointment or whatever. So you see that some of us can charter a bus. It's like a, you know, this kind of Kumasi Ford cars, you know, in those, I, I think it's still there. That runs from Asafo somewhere to Accra. You see that sometimes you are 10 and you don't really want to go to the STC because maybe the time that is departing will not suit your appointment or whatever. So you can, all of you can go and say, okay, you know what? Uh, you operate this kind of service. Take us to Accra, this one from door to door. So Chata is just the same thing like road transport, exclusive. This is where the customer or the owner has an exclusive use of that uh, aircraft to go from A, the same A to B. Sometimes for a fee, sometimes to for free. You understand? It all depends on the one who owns the charter company and the agreement that he or she has with the customers. So it could either be for a free, I mean, a, a fee, or it could be for free. That's the difference between uh, airline and a charter. But charter, I mean, airline is strictly for a fee. I, I, I hope, I, I hope um, you, you, you get me. Yes, please. I've understood the difference between the airline and the uh, charter company. So now, if someone asks me what is a charter company, I would say that a, a charter company is like the short row or the VIP service, where you charter a bus to a place. But in this sense, you are chartering an aircraft. Yes. OK. And you have exclusive use of it, just like how you would have had exclusive use of the air. Uh, okay. I know sometimes it's because some people are not really going to the main airports, for, for example, like um, you, not everybody going to London Heathrow, you know, the, the, or London Gatwick or London Stansted. Some people are going to a place we call Farnborough, which is also a city in London, and they just want to move from their homes to Farnborough without going through main airports and stuff like that. So these are some of the reasons for charter. That's the exclusive use of aircraft. Okay, all right. Captain, can you throw light on the careers in the airline industry? Some of the careers, maybe five, five things that people can do in the airline industry. Okay, for ease of understanding, I would um, divide it into the core uh, function or the core career function and the support. Okay, so like we said, airline is in the business of going from A to B for a fee. Okay. But it got to a certain point in time. You know, when the airline started initially, it was almost like you and the pilot. And that's, I mean, when I say you, I mean talking of customer or the passenger. It was passenger and pilot. You drive to the remote area where you want to um, 
um, they take your flight. You meet the pilot standing in front of you, welcoming you. And um, he, he, he just takes your bag, throws it into the cargo hold, shows you where to sit. He sits in the aircraft, he starts it, and off you go. When you get to the other side, he's the same person who opened the door and um, gets you off, go to the baggage side, pick your bag, you, I mean, or maybe by that time, he will pick all the bags down there for you to uh, select yours, and off you go home. In those days from the, I, 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 as you are even at that place called the airstrips in those days, uh, or the airports, if you can call it the airports. The airports were almost like strips. So you go and land, and the person coming to meet you has just parked his, his or her car just almost, almost next to the aircraft. That was how it, it all started in those days. So in those days, nobody was looking at careers per se. But obviously, as safety and things began to evolve and we were all pushing for quality surveys after some few incidents here and there, then came the careers. So the careers could be cut now. So today, we don't talk of only the pilot and the passenger. Today, we talk about the core team. So first of all, I will start off with, if I go to work, who do I go and um, uh, interact with? So we have what we call the operations control center. That, this is the nerve center. People have different names for it. People call it flight dispatch. Some people call it operations control center. Some people call it flight operations control. It's the same thing. Basically, this is the unit or the career or these people are involved in preparing the aircraft for the crew. Then after the, um, I mean, preparing the aircraft simply means they'll get the weather. I and mean, when I talk of weather, the detailed weather of their departure point and route, destination, they get all these weathers. There's something in our industry we call no terms, notices to airmen. What's happening in our field of operations? Is there any work which is supposed to be done at the airport? Or is there any uh, runway, is, uh, 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 are the runways being reduced for construction purposes or anything? They get all this information that the pilot needs for dispatch. So by the time the pilot reports to him, he has all these things ready about the weather, the operations, the aircraft itself. So they, these, these people will liaise with the engineers to get the status of the particular aircraft that's going to be used. And um, after getting all this information and discussing with the uh, captain, that's when the captain or the crew decide to fly. So we talk of, first of all, those who are in the flight operations department, which has so many names. People call it, so an aircraft dispatcher could be seen as one of the careers that is available, the aircraft dispatcher. Then we can talk of the engineers. You know, I mentioned engineers because the dispatcher will liaise with the engineers or the technicians. So you could have, you can have, an, you can be an aircraft technician who really repairs the aircraft and you can sign it off after you've repaired it. We have the aircraft engineers who see to the overall operations of what goes on in the maintenance department. So one, carrier one, we can talk of an aircraft dispatcher. He's the one who coordinates with all the relevant authorities to provide the flight crew with the information they need for the flight. We can talk about the maintenance section, which has the, which has the technicians and engineers, making sure that the aircraft is in top form. And all these things I'm saying that, oh, the people get information as the uh, dispatcher. They get information to give to the pilot. It's under a certain regulation. So the regulation spells out what kind of information they have to get to the pilot and how. Same with the engineering. When we say that they are the people or the maintenance people are the crew that get the aircraft in top form before flight, the question is, what is top form? We have some regulations in the International Civil Aviation Organization document that spells what top form must be. That's the way they go about maintaining the aircraft and keeping it in top form. It's all spelled out there. So we've got pilot, I'm sorry, we've got dispatcher, we've got engineers. Then now the pilot of today won't be the person who would open the doors and uh, for a uh, disembarkation and embarkation and things like that. We now have flight attendants and their duty is for, for safety and comfort in the cabin. So we are about three careers so far, flight dispatcher, um, aviation, um, I mean, aircraft technician or engineer. Then we have the cabin crew. They also have various names as and when generations change. In those days, we knew it as air hostess. Then they changed to flight attendants. Then people call it customer experience coordinators. Uh, the thing just keeps changing names. But they, their uh, responsibility is to 
uh, make sure that uh, the passengers are safe and comfortable during flight. It's not only about serving beverages and meals, but it's also about making sure that in the event of an emergency, they're able to evacuate them safely and just take the, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, they're responsible for everything safety in the cabin. Then we have the pilots themselves who do the core business. They are the ones who fly who the core business from A to B. So this is about the core section. So it's in the core section, we've got about four careers. That's the dispatcher, the aircraft technician, the engineer, the flight attendants, then the, the, the pilots themselves. They are, they are the ones in the core areas. Okay, so let's go to the support session. I'm just trying to cut it short because there are dozens of careers. So we'll go to, let's say, the support section. Now, this is these are the people who are not involved in the real A to B work, but they support the A to B work. For example, the customer service um, agents, those who do the check-in, make sure that all their needs are being met. That's number one. So we have the customer service agents. Then we have... The salespeople, in fact, in now, in now that we are in the 21st century, sales and marketing is a very, 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 very key issue. Uh, you know, you don't leave sales and marketing to chance. You really, really have to um, have a plan, just like how marketing is, right? From the design stage to research, to production, pricing, distribution. We have a core team which is uh, responsible for if I say filling the aircraft seats, if I should make it very clear to the layman that when you say you are in the sales and or marketing department, your core work is to uh, fill the aircraft seats, okay, and, uh, and at the right price. In fact, there is both the right to say, fill the right uh, aircraft seats at the right price and make profit for your airline. These three things at the same time. So we have the sales section, like I said. So in the support section, we have the customer service section. We have the sales and marketing session. Then we have people in the administration session, which can also further be divided into so much. Human resource, just like any other company, human resource is now a big deal, okay? Then we have the IT session, okay? IT, that's uh, your, the, the IT, you know, related to uh, airline business. So we have the IT session. Then we have the finance session, the one who is going to control the income and expenditure of uh, funds. And all these courses I've mentioned have regulated courses you one has to do to get in. So basically, on the to summarize it all, from the um, core side, we have the aircraft dispatcher. We have the aircraft dispatcher too. Today, some of them will also know 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 themselves as flight operations engineers. Same old story. They do the same thing. So aircraft dispatcher or flight operations engineers, aircraft technician or engineers. Then we have. Um, the flight attendants or the cabin crew experience um, personnel and we have the pilots so that's on the core side then on the support side like i said we have the customer service clients i'm sorry the customer service agents then we they are the ones to make sure that from the time the passenger walks into the airport to check in all the way to the time he gets onto the aircraft there are people who manage them to make sure that they have their best experience then we have the sales and marketing folks they are to make sure that the seats are filled at the right price and the company makes profits. That's their core work. Then we have the same thing, human resource uh, departments. Then we have IT departments. Then we have um, security because up until the 1950s in aviation history, up until the 1950s when hijacking now be, started to become like a, a, a festival, uh, security also got heightened. So they are the people to make sure that customers are prevented from all manner of threats, ranging from pickpockets to hijacking. You know, there's also a unit in the airline that makes sure that um, clients or customers are prevented from uh, all manner of threats. So basically, these are the careers. I think I've mentioned it. I hope you have, I'm done with it. Okay. Thank you very much, Captain Amwa. I'd like to thank Captain. Thompson for joining this session as well. So please, we have Captain Samuel Thompson, a veteran aviation industry stakeholder, joining our session today. Welcome, Captain. Oh, Captain Thompson. Okay, he's muted. All right, so Captain Amon, in your Definitions, you said you have the core team and then the support team. 
But when you defined airlines, you said that airlines are, are organizations that move people from point one to point B commercially. So basically, if what defines an airline is the commercial bit. But in your description of the core team, I've realized that those who make up the core team don't really bring any commercial value to the chain. So why is it that the customer service people or the sales people who bring the commercial parts into the airline business, why are they not part of the core team? Okay, because um, in an airline in the business, the core team are those who actually do the movement or are directly involved in the movement from A to B, directly involved. The engineer who will service the aircraft and release it to the captain is doing the direct, anything got to do with directly moving the airplane from A to B. Okay, that's uh, number, uh, uh, number one. And um, the, the flight dispatcher or the aircraft dispatcher, same story. This is direct involvement, okay, of getting the aircraft from A to B, as far as the airline definition or the airline concept is concerned. Then uh, the pilot himself is the, actually, he's the one doing the work itself, actually from A to B. But like I said, he can't do it alone. That's why he needs these people around him first. He needs these people around him first to do the actual movement from A to B. So when the support team, nobody's saying that the support team are not doing anything. The support team are the ones who bring the people, yes. But that's not core. Bringing somebody to come and sit down is not core. Is the moving somebody from the A to the B that is core. So if you helped me take somebody from A to B, you are supporting my activities by first of all, that's in terms of the uh, sales and marketing department, you are the one supposed to fill the seats. When it comes to the finance department, you are the one controlling income and expenditure and everything. All those ones are not the direct involvement from, uh, move, from moving people from A to B. Are you okay? So, uh, uh, um, um, uh, that's why they are classified under the supports. They support us uh, and they are, they are not directly involved in the movement from A to B. So they are not directly involved in the movement of the aircraft from point A to point B. Yes. Please. That's the reason why they are the supporting team. Yes. Okay. All right, Captain. Thank you for your explanation. We are here today because of before you say, I want to be. What is it and how would it help us if we partake in this event? Okay, before you say, I want to be basically has two main objectives. First of all, to keep the history of global aviation and also the local aviation, keep it from not dying off, if they say, if I should say, and also expose people to the industry see what it's all about before those who want to make choices of either being part of it can now have enough information to say, yes, I want to be in this industry. So that before you say I want to be in there, just simply means that if you want to be in this aviation industry, things that will expose you to, for you to have the detailed information before you say, yes, I want to be part of this. So basically it has two objectives celebrating the Wright brothers and the aviation history entirely, and also introducing the aviation industry, basically through different fun ways, you understand? Uh, and uh, basically we'll get the message to the uh, 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 people who want to know what it's about before making choices. Okay. All right, Captain. Okay, so we are all on the Aviation Canteen show where we serve it hot. Our guest for today is Captain Amwa, and I am Elizabeth Chumwasasu, your host. Please, we've heard what Captain has said so far. If you have any questions, comments, or contributions, kindly key it in the chat box, or you can raise up your hand to be called. We are having a discussion on the history of airlines in the world, how airlines came into being. Okay, Captain, please. Can you tell us the first airline in Ghana and what went into bringing that airline? What was the motivation 
in bringing the airline to Ghana? Okay, yeah, the history just has it that first, uh, a couple of countries like we, Nigeria, and things still under the colonial master, uh, were operating something called British Overseas Airways Corporation, BOAC. Then later it narrowed down to West African Airline Corporation, something like WAAC, with headquarters based in Lagos. Okay. Then came, of course, we another history to have it that just when every country was getting independence, their leaders were pushing for their own national, their national airline. It had been in Krumah's dream and everything to make sure that we get it, you know, around the time that uh, we're getting our independence. So that is what gave birth to Ghana Airways in 1958. But before then, the people who were needed to start the airline or in all these areas I've mentioned were trained about five years prior to that time. That was when we were still under the colonial master and the West African Airways Corporation and all these things. The people, some were selected, the first pioneer captains were selected from schools, you know, were selected from the schools. Some of them were doing their six form courses and they were selected based on some criteria. And all the people who were needed were selected and trained. And so almost like to say they will be trained and be doing attachment with the West African or Airways Corporation. Then later, they will all be absorbed into the national airline. But the national airline itself, if, if I should say, to be fair to Nkrumah and history, it achieved its dream. So by 1958, by the time Ghana Airways was birthed, uh, we had some of our own people you know, who were uh, in control of affairs, still with a little bit of the expatriates, but it got to a certain point in time, the whole thing was being run by our own uh, citizenry. So basically that's about a brief history about how it started under BOAC, then to West African Airways Corporation, then on to um, um, this thing, um, the, the, Ghana then to the Ghana Airways. And like I said, by and by the whole citizen, our own citizens began to, uh, uh, be, if I say, uh, employees. Oh, okay. All right. So Ghana Airways was a national career. Yes, it was. For Ghana. All right. Yeah. Do you have any idea when individuals started investing in the private sector of the airline industry? Yes. And there's something in history we call the regulation. Regulation is, um, 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 like I said, in the history, from history in the 1920s and 1930s, um, almost every country owned their own airline. Then in 1978, um, in, the, in the US, I think they all sat down and said, look, running an airline is very complex. It looks so innocent from the face value, you know, from the surface, very, very complex. So um, people thought, um, uh, people thought that, look, Government cannot continue to go through this complexity. Because, you know, government has a lot of priorities. Apart from they investing in transport, they have health to look at, they have uh, other sectors of their economy to look at. And, you know, the airline too is the one that, if you have to invest in it, you, it doesn't have to go through a chain of bureaucracies where you have to take a decision to parliament, then they go and do, yeah, 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 yeah. all this time, time is going and we need to do something. So, I think the Americans saw it convenient that you know something. Let us open this quote unquote the floodgates to private people who also want to come and invest. So October 1978 was the, the first Americans. They led the way in uh, this. We call it deregulation. Deregulation simply means that the government doesn't own um, or the, the, this industry, but it has let loose. Let, deregulation doesn't mean that. The government has washed its hands off. The, the word D simply means loose. It has let loose the kind of uh, operation of this business to private people, provided they will come and meet all the safety and the regulatory criteria, fine. Then we started to let loose. Then uh, Canada, I think Canada followed, US, uh, Europe also followed, and by and by and by, this whole thing started to catch on with people. So the basic thing is that if you meet a certain criteria, in terms of safety wise, uh, you know, regulatory wise and everything, then the government allows you to operate. Some countries, it is a no, no. The government has still not given any uh, private person any uh, uh, room to operate. Some countries do, yes, you can operate maybe under some conditions. Some of them fully regulated, as in fully deregulated, as in they themselves are not involved. 
So basically, it started in 78, then in 85, I think the British followed, then it started moving around the world. So basically, the, 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 sorry, the Europeans, I think, in 1985. Okay. So basically, that's how the airline industry uh, came about. Oh, okay. For the private people. Yeah, privatization. Pri yes. Private, okay, private investment. Yes. All right. Please, what of Ghana? What was the first private airline in Ghana? Hmm. The first private airline. Um, okay, I think I, it, it all started with, uh, I stand to be corrected, but it all started with CTK. The CityLink we know of today did not really start off as an airline per se. They were, we were first credit them for the first general, well-established general aviation. You know, like as we were talking about the whole aviation structure, general aviation is the fourth child of the aviation industry. So um, the, um, general aviation is into things which are not airline, not military, but other services that support the whole industry, like fuel, charters, training, and all these things. So I will credit CityLink for the first recognized, established um, 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 uh, private general aviation or general aviation, but they slowly, you know, um, there was people who have come and gone. Sometimes you, you don't feel comfortable speaking about their history. We've heard of Fun Air. We've heard of Golden Airways. They were all domestics. So Golden Airways came somewhere in 96. Uh, at that time, C uh, CTK had come about maybe three years prior to that, but not operating as an airline. They were doing a bit of charters and training and aerial photography and stuff. But with Golden Airways, the one that sharply comes to mind was Golden Airways in 1996. Then it vanished somewhere a year or two after. Then we had Fun Air. Then we had Milk Air. And trust me, some are, a lot have come and gone. Sobel Air. And um, we've done then City Links. Then around that time, City Link now decided to become an airline. That was okay. almost ten. That, that was almost ten years after uh, ten years after being in general aviation. They became an airline, you know, that's the city link. They, were not, they came first as CTK, then city link. And when they started the airline 203, but they, came, they, they launched together with Antrac in the, I think September 203. So um, these were the people recognizable ones we had. Then later others came into the fray. Like we said, some have come and gone and uh, the surviving ones are what we see today, Africa World Airlines, Passion, and you know, but the rest of them, they um, they, they 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 just uh, phased out of the system. There have been so many. Some even came; they just lasted for one week and they went, you know, and everything. But <laughs> yes, that that's yeah. how that, that's what we've seen on this side of the road. Yeah, I think I remember one such airline was it Tyson, where a lot of staff ran away from their companies to join Tyson. Uh, because of the remuneration, attractive remuneration, but and they couldn't start operations at all. Looking at the history of airlines in Ghana, especially for private airlines, I think it, 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 it's about um, either 20 private airlines in Ghana, 20, 25, 30 years for private airlines in Ghana. And most of them have gone different. Would you say that the system is not good for the airlines, the establishment of the airlines, or people just find an interest in investing in an airline, but when they get into it, they realize that, oh no, this is not the place for us. And then they just close up and go. Yes. Um, <laughs> This is okay. One of the reasons we are doing this before you say I want to be is not only for children between the ages of three to 19 as advertised and everything. It's also for people to businessmen to listen to it, you know, uh, because information or knowledge is very important in this industry. This industry, this layman, layman business, it doesn't work. It's really if you want to run an airline. Okay. So if you're a businessman and you have this vision of doing it, there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to arm yourself with knowledge. This is why we constantly do all these yearly events to commemorate all these things and try to get aviation closer to people's doorstep. So one of the reasons I've seen is that, uh, one, people were not armed with the knowledge that was needed to run an airline. 
it gets complex by the year. That one is not the fault of the investor. It's the whole industry thing always trying to be safe. And sometimes incidents and accidents are used to modify or improve its operations. But in aviation, it comes at a cost. Improving services, that's the safety and quality, comes at a great, great cost. I've seen people in finance department who have been so angry. <laughs> They've been so angry because sometimes they themselves are the ones who may be approved for a check of maybe $750,000. This is an example. $750,000 to go and order spare parts. Okay, to the to the finance man's mind, you know, to his mind, he is thinking that with that seven hundred fifty thousand that he's approved, that, I mean U.S. dollars, so seven hundred fifty thousand U.S. dollars that he has approved, he's expecting to fill a storehouse with okay. maybe parts. Mm -hmm. Then uh, they say shipment, shipment, it has gone to arrive at the arrival hall. They go and take the the, the thing out. It's in a box, and the whole part itself of that seven hundred fifty thousand looks like a cell phone. I've seen some. <laughs> I've seen some of these finance people go mad. They've gone bananas, you know. You see, because this shows you that, look, where they were coming from, maybe they didn't arm themselves with knowledge. And this is just a small part that is needed in the aircraft that if it's not in that aircraft, the aircraft can't go anywhere. You understand? But okay. look at how expensive it is. You know, some of these devices, the navigational devices and things like that. So one, I think people that, uh, the businessmen don't have knowledge that, look, it's not about counting the number of seats and the price you are going to charge multiplied by the seats and how much money is going to the bank, that means you are running an airline. You have to look at the costs. When I say knowledge, the cost is not too known to so many people. Is that the cost of maintenance? Because maintenance has to be of a certain structure. It can't be of any mediocre something. You know, like I said, they, we maintain aircraft according to some regulations. The whole operations is done according to some regulations. So where the businessmen falter is that they don't have any idea of their costs. They only, they, only, they only know how to calculate what will come in, you know, and they think that once I do more adverts, more adverts, more adverts, I'm going to get this money. Fine, you can get it. But the thing is that they don't really have a idea of the cost to keep an airline safe and in quality. It's not a joke. You understand? It's really, 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 really not a joke. So um, that's first thing, knowledge. Okay, what I've seen, not only in Ghana, it's happened in Nigeria. I've, I've flown in Nigeria before, and trust me, they have gone through more crazy things than even us. There was one point in time when I was there in 2005. I went there to fly. We had only about 42 uh, operators. But something happened where the supervision had to come and tighten regulations and now, I mean, uh, keep an extra eye on them. They had to cut down the operators from 42 to 18 because most of them were not going according to the regulations, which led to a lot of incidents in some time back. So basically, first point, the problem here is knowledge. People don't want to uh, arm themselves with knowledge, and they also don't want to employ somebody who is expert. Many people don't want to employ people who are experts in the field because they think if they are the ones coughing out their money, they should be taking calling the shots, okay? It may work in some other industries, but as for aviation, trust me, if you don't know anything about it and you want to call the shots, it's very, very, very dicey. So. One is knowledge, and number two, the financial muscle that is needed, uh, you know, can come as a shock to some people because some people don't understand. Like I was telling you about the spare parts issue. I'm sure some people knew about how aircraft spares. You see, the aircraft itself that you see over there, the body is nothing. The house of the body is just an aluminum or fiberglass something. What makes it expensive is what in the, what's in the cockpit, okay? The systems that is needed to get this whole thing safely from here to there, is what makes the aircraft price. It's not really about the body of the aircraft per se. So people, I was whether as for that side, I don't want to comment so much on it. So whether people have that financial muscle to keep the thing going, I don't want to look into people's pocket. But what has happened in the past has told us that they didn't have, you know, that they didn't have the financial muscle to keep things going um, because you may not break even for six years. Question: Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it to be that, okay, it doesn't matter. I know I'm going to go into this kind of business and it's not, it's not now that I need my returns. Are you ready for it? Uh, you know, some people I know sold their houses to come and start an airline. I mean, some of them even packed up from UK. They were in their UK banking sector, having fun and, you know, with themselves. Somebody went to sell this idea to them. They found an airplane somewhere and they came down. You know, things like that. But the thing is that, uh, the financial muscle to keep it going always gets complex by the year. 
Some time back, it wasn't too much of a big deal. But now and tomorrow and the days, I mean, the days to come, it's really a big deal. So basically, that's what it is with the um, um, knowledge and the financial muscles, what is needed to survive an airline. These two things. If you do, you're not either or, you need it all the two. Oh, okay. So without knowledge and financial muscle, you can start an airline today and it will collapse tomorrow. Very easily. It can do that. Is When I say financial muscle, a comfortable between 80 to 100 million US dollars in, wow. the, bank, in the bank that you don't need for six years. That's what will keep you going. You know, that, that's what will keep you going. Comfortable. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, Captain. Thank you. We are on the Aviation Canteen Show where we serve it hot. My name is Elizabeth Chumwasasu, and our guest is Captain Victor Amwa. Please, if you have any questions, contributions, and comments, you can keep it in the chat box or kindly raise up your hand. Captain is available to answer all your questions. Please, do we have anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question? Do you want to ask a question about the discussion on ground or the previous discussions that we've had so far? Do we have anyone in the audience? Okay, thank you. Captain, it seems no one <laughs> wants to ask a question or contribute, I guess. We've all understood what Captain has said today. Okay, silence means consent. So we've all understood what Captain has said today about airlines, the history on airlines. And we spoke about the history of airlines in Ghana. The history of airlines in Ghana the national carrier and private organizations as well. Captain is saying that if you don't acquire knowledge and you don't have the financial muscle that can sustain your organization for more than six years, do not invest in an airline. Because even a small part that looks like a phone would have a value of 750,000 US dollars. Let's be mindful of our investments and what we use our money to do. Captain, before you say, I wanna be, can you tell us the format of the program that before okay. you say, I wanna be, which is okay. coming on in December? Yes, like we said, um, the, uh, Ghana has been divided into three zones. That's the northern zone, or uh, sorry, the Sahara zone, then the middle zone. That is uh, the uh, the middle zone and the southern zone. So with the northern zone, I'll start with the northern zone first. Um, the northern zone that day they will have theirs on the twenty first December, Tuesday, twenty first December, um, um, twenty twenty one. Basically, an airport tour. They are going to have an airport tour. Uh, and the whole idea of the airport tour is uh, for them to understand airports and its contribution to the whole success of the aviation industry. Both the yeah. Then uh, from the airport tour, they will be sent to a museum in Tamale. Somebody has uh, set up an aviation museum. Go there to go and find out, uh, see what it's about. Museum, we are preserving so many history. All these things that we've heard of in the history from the Wright brothers to today, that one you've heard it, you may see some pictures in books, but it's also an opportunity for them to go there and see some of the aircraft that have served the world and are, are in their resting place, you know, ready for uh, viewing. Okay, so they will go to the aviation museum. Then the next uh, point is going to have a certain center, a simulation center still in Tamale, where they are just going to have a feel of, you know, how the aircraft flies. And also, there'll be other programs where we'll try to launch the aviation quiz uh, programs uh, that we've planned for 2023. But starting from now to 2023, how are we going to do it? Then they'll have more information about the programs we do, our aviation teens camp and everything. 
So basically, that's what will happen in the northern zone. That's those within the Savannah region, northern region, upper east, upper west. It's happening in Tamale to serve that side. Then the middle zone, yeah, that's the Kumbe, Ashanti, Bronga, Hafo, maybe a bit of eastern, the Bono regions and stuff, will happen in Kumasi itself. Kumasi uh, more. That is uh, Atlan in Kumasi more. And the um, Kumasi Mall one is the same thing. The only difference between the Tamale and Kumasi is that there's no museum for them to um, visit in Kumasi as a aviation museum. But they also do an airport tour with the same objective. And uh, from there, you come to a place called Kumasi Kitty Artland on the Kumasi Mall for the same activities I was talking about, about uh, the launching of the programs we want to do uh, for 2023. The aviation quiz is for the ages of uh, five years to 12 years, uh, where this same thing we've spoken about, the Wright brothers and how it has gone through Ghana history and so many things will be, uh, if I say, launched. There's, well, basically, there's going to be a program where the grand finale will be in 2023, God Give Us Life, because two years now, 2023, aviation will be 120 years. So there'll be a quiz that will be lead up to that. Then we have for the teens, we have what we call the Aero Teens Camp. We are still building all these people into the aviation industry. So the Aero Teens Camp 2022, details will be given uh, during the, uh, those programs. Then um, Accra itself is where the fun is. I won't say the fun, for lack of a better word. Those of you who want to experience a flight ride, it's only Accra that you have to come to because the flight ride is going to happen at Afienya Airstrip. And um, Afienya Airstrip is there. We have the rates for 30 minutes flight and the rates for 15 minutes flights. So those of you who want to come and experience, some of you want to come and experience what it is like sitting in a, a training aircraft for different reasons. Maybe you want to become pilots or you want to become the core, like a flight dispatcher. You want to just feel like how it is like in a training aircraft. Some people also want to just do it for just for the sake of experience. They've been sitting in passenger related aircraft. So we have flight rides on that day, 17 December. We chose the 17 December, the flight ride, because that's what happened that day, 20, I mean, 118 years ago. So there'll be flight rides uh, uh, at Afenia, together with what I've just mentioned, all these launching programs and everything. So we, we're doing it step by step. There will be, of course, there will be press events. The press people will get to know uh, what happened on that day. You, uh, you know, the press will get to know what happened on that day and everything. So press briefing, flight ride will also happen in Accra. So we promise to make it exciting. If there are any COVID issues, we'll try to make it, uh, if I say, respect it as much as possible. But these are the three things we want to do to celebrate uh, this day is not really a, uh, if I say a big, big grand thing, but like I said, it's going to be nice and short and sweet. Okay, Captain, it's going to be nice and short and sweet before you say, I want to be. I'd encourage everyone on this platform today to be part of this program. All of us who are passionate about the aviation industry will be there. There will be mentorship sessions. As Captain said, without knowledge, you can't survive in the aviation industry. And these are the opportunities that are given to us for us to use to acquire knowledge. We all know how expensive aviation education is. So if you can get, let's say, 10 aviation stakeholders under one platform to engage you, to teach you, to entertain you on what the aviation industry is. I'd say 70 Ghana cities. I would say it's worth your while. December is a festive season. So when you are blocking your seats, I would encourage you that block these dates as part of the things that you want to do at the end of 2021. Going into 2022, you would understand what it means to be an aviation person. And you can make a decision on 31st December to be part of the aviation industry.
to be part of the aviation industry. Thank you, Captain, for joining us today. The lines are opened for questions, contributions, and comments. You can also key in your questions in the chat box so that we can ask Captain. It's been over an hour of engagement with Captain Amwa, who has taken us through the history of airlines. Airlines are part of the aviation industry. He's taken us through the history and he's spoken about certain careers that make up the airline industry, where we have the core, the core people, and then we have the supporting people. All these people, without them, the aeroplane would not fly. Because if the supporting team does not fill the aircraft, how will the airline get money to take care of the core team? So everyone in the industry plays an important role just to get the aircraft in the air from one destination to the other. We'll be concluding this session very soon. So please, if you have any questions, comments, or contributions, kindly let us know. Hello, Captain. Yes, Lizzie. Uh, just, uh, oh, okay, let me just, before they start coming in, um, to please call the numbers as early as possible for the booking, as well as those in Accra. The numbers which are on the screens as early as possible, then they will be enrolled. There's a way they'll teach them how to enroll into all this program and um, um, how to get it. The earlier, the better, because um, we want to know these things by next week. And um, uh, they will show you the various rates, the, the various rates that even if you are not also coming to partake in the flight ride, what you have to, what you have to do and et cetera. So I encourage them to start calling uh, for enrollment and things like that and uh, how, how to get enrolled and everything. Kumase has this contact. Those in the, the Sahelian has the contact. Then the, those of us in the South, there's a place for them to uh, enroll. Let, 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 let's meet them there. And I think it's going to be exciting. I'm ready to take their questions. OK. Please, do you have any questions for Captain? Do you have any questions for Captain? I would be posting the link for registration in the chat box as well. So anyone here today can click on that link and register. Register your participation now. This will be a very interesting event. This is the place where you get to meet so many aviation stakeholders without having to pay so much. So I would encourage you take advantage of it. Please, the link is in the chat box. The link is in the chat box. So anyone can register. And then after registration, you can call us. When I say us, I mean the numbers on the platform to make payments for the Accra events. If you want to just participate, come to the grounds and listen to the speeches and the mentor mentorship sessions, it's just 70 Ghana cities. But if you want to participate in this historic flight discovery tour, where you have 15 minutes or 30 minutes interactions with a pilot in the air, then your damage is just 700 CDs for 15 minutes and 1,000 CDs for 30 minutes. For those in Kumasi and the middle sector, the damage is just 100 CDs, and then you'll get to know more about this industry that we are all passionate about. Tamale is also going to be very interesting where you'd get a chance to visit the Red Clay Museum. This Red Clay Museum belongs to a Ghanaian artist. And this artist uses planes. So if you are here and you've been privy to some of the airlines that have gone different, when I say different, the airlines that have stopped flying, they've gone bankrupt and you are not seeing the airplanes anymore. When you get involved in the Tamale 
events, you will see this aeroplanes. You would see this aeroplanes because an artist in Ghana has taken it upon himself to preserve history, preserve aviation history. And this preservation is in Tamale. Let's all try to take advantage of this before you say, I wanna be event. Let's get to understand the careers in the aviation industry. After understanding these, it would inform our decision to be part of the aviation industry. If all industries in the world go different, they don't exist anymore. Believe you me, the aviation industry would not go different. Aviation industry is one of the industries that would survive the test of time. Look at what is happening now in the world where we have COVID-19 disturbing everyone. The most affected industry is the aviation industry, but we are still moving strong because without this industry, we can't move goods, services, and human beings from one destination to another within the course of a few hours. So the aviation industry it's a resilient industry and it is here to stay. Captain, as we don't have any questions, comments or contributions, I'd like to engage you to give your concluding remarks to today's session. Also, please, the link is in the chat box. Kindly click on it and register your participation. The event will start on the 11th of December in Tamale. And then it will cruise all the way to Accra on the 17th of December, 118th birthday of the Wright brothers. Then we would climax it in Kumasi on the 21st of December. Kindly book this as part of the events for the Christmas festivities. We hope to see you on that day. Captain, your concluding remarks. Yes, um, tell, tell them to tell a friend, to tell another friend, to tell another friend yeah, to enroll and just be part of this uh, event. And uh, what happens is that the moment they enroll, they will be on a platform where we continue to give them continuous updates. Maybe along the line, some of these things we are talking like mentoring sessions and things will even come before that day. Some may come on that day itself. Some may come as well. They should just call a tell a friend to tell a friend to be, as be part of this and roll and be present there. And um, we'll put them on one platform. Then we start giving them updates from today up until that time. And here again, too, we don't want to get into this aviation industry by hearsay. So most, most people have gotten into it by hearsay and also by some by false default. You understand what I mean? Maybe you write your SHS exam two times, you don't make it, and some of them you know, that's how some people have gotten into this industry. They tell you how they got it. We don't want that. You know, we don't want that kind of thing. What we want is come and experience it. It's going to be a yearly affair. It's not only, that's why you see that it's called before you say, I want to be 2021, because God willing us, so far as God gives us life, it's going to be a yearly affair. And through all these things that you're going, just like how you people get themselves um, um, and tools with sports and other things. This is the same way you also have to get yourself in tools in a very unique industry like this, so that you come and get things from well-informed sources. You don't just um, 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 come and um, choose career because you, some friend is doing it or you think flying around is fun or something. People have done that and really not been so happy. So please tell a friend, tell a friend, tell another friend, then let's spread this word around so that we see you there on these days. Once you're on the platform, more updates will be, uh, be given. That's the letter I have for them. And I thank them for making time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Thank you very much, Captain Victor Amwa, our guest for today's Aviation Canteen show on the theme, Before You Say I Wanna Be. Thank you to our guests for also joining us today to listen to what Captain has for us. We are grateful that you were able to make it. My name is Elizabeth Chumwa Sasu, your host 
for today. And we've all been enjoying the conversation on the Aviation Canteen Show, where we serve it hot. I look forward to meeting you at one of these events in December before you say, I want to be. Kindly click on the link, register your participation. And as I say, this is an event that will be worth your while. Thank you and see you another time on a different topic. Bye.